Okay, example two. See if you can pause this one once I get through and show you the questions, or you probably have it on the handout. Um, and see if you can do this one on your own. I basically ask the same questions, I believe. So the data in the table represent the club head speed and distance a golf ball travels for eight swings of a club. So use the regression feature of the TI to find a line of best fit. And then use the calculator to make a scatter plot of the data, have the calculator draw the line of best fit, and then use the equation to predict the distance of the ball will travel if the club head speed is 104 miles per hour. And determine the coefficient of determination and interpret. That's going to be huge in here. Make sure you're able when I sometimes I put those adding questions, interpret or explain or why, and those are left blank. And that's the most important part. So make sure you answer that. Okay, and rather than showing you live, I think you're comfortable going in and doing some of the minutiae of putting the data in. I think it's good to see the first few live, but now I think we can screenshot should work. Okay, so step one, we need to both the X and the Y. Press stat, edit, enter the data in to L1 and L2. Uh, find line of best fit, press um, stat, select four, linear regression. And step four, again, put L1, comma L2, and if you want that function to be graphed, put Y1. Now if you don't need the scatter, scatter plot of this, and um, we always encourage you to do a graph of this first to even see if a linear model is even appropriate, right? I mean if it looks, um, when we plot it ends up looking something like this, um, a linear model may not be the one to use. It wouldn't be the one to use if it looked like that. So we always plot it. So our equation we end up getting is 3.1661x minus 55.7966. And so using sort of regular words for the variables y hat and x, the distance equals, distance hat equals 3.1661 times the club speed minus 55.7966. And this may seem like a superfluous step to do that, but it will really help you out when you, when I ask follow-up questions, you won't be flipping back and trying to determine what y and x are, or y hat and x are. Um, you will have already made that determination. It just makes it, it will make you, your interpretation of the problem flow much better. Okay, step six, you can press y equals, um, and there's your equation, paste it in, and then we can um, go ahead and use a scatter plot. Just press second y equals, we want to make sure our stat plot is on and that we've selected the appropriate model, which in this case is this um, the scatter plot. And just make sure that your list L1 and L2 are in there. Sometimes those get changed around, so always glance down there. Press zoom 9, and there we go. There's our graph. You can do the very similar thing in StatCrunch or Minitab. And Excel is actually not bad at doing um, regression equations. Part C. Um, use the equation in A, in part A, to predict the distance a golf ball will travel if the club head speed is 104 miles per hour. Okay, then again, there's our formula. Plug in 104 for club speed. See how easy that is that we have it written this way? Club speed is 104. I don't have to go back and reinterpret all of that. Uh, just plop the 104 in for club speed. You know, in algebra class, we typically left it in Y's and X's. We didn't put the actual words in. Um, Depends on your teacher, of course, but um, most folks end up just leaving it in terms of X's and Y's. Um, but I think there's a lot of value in being able to do this, so that's the last I'll say of that. Crunch it out, we get distance is 273.5 feet. Determine the coefficient of determination, R squared, and interpret. Okay, so I meant to have that box come up a little bit later, but anyway. Um, there is our R square value right here at about 88.1%. So R square says that 88.1% of the variability in the distance, so in the, the response variable, the Y variable, is accounted for by variation in the club speed and the explanatory variable. And that kind of makes sense, right? You expect the distance to be affected by club speed. If I, if I swing the club slower, it's not going to go as far. Okay, let's look back at residuals again. Um, recall the residual part. The residual is the part of the data 
that was not modeled, right? Um, the residual, if you kind of recall from an earlier problem, is this distance right here, right? So you can think of it as the data equals the model plus the residual, right? So our data, all our data is the model, which is right here, plus the residual, and that, that's all the data. So residuals, if we just subtract a model from both sides, just solving for residuals, residuals equals data minus model. Another way to think of this is the residuals equals the observed, which is the data, right? The data is what we are, are observing, minus the predicted, minus the predicted, which is the model right here, which is our, our line, that's our prediction. So when we want to know um, how well this model fits, um, we can ask instead to see what the model missed. Um, and to see this, we look at a plot of the residuals. So we're going to look at a residual plot. Okay, so um, statistical software packages like um, Minitab and StatCrunch, um, I think even Excel, um, and the TI plot residuals. So how do we know from looking at residual plot the linear model makes sense? If it's appropriate, it should be the under the um, when a regression model is appropriate, it should be the underlying relationship. Nothing should be left behind. So after we fit this regression model, we plot the residuals in the hope of finding nothing. We want that plot to be the most boring scatter plot you have ever seen. We don't want to see any trends or patterns or anything interesting. If you look at that and go, ooh, interesting, something is wrong with our original model. Not really wrong, but it may not model it as uh, linearly as we wanted it to as we expected it to. And in StatCrunch, for instance, you may have, we kind of went blew through it when we went there, but using the same one, one of those screens, we had the option. Um, I think I marked plot the fitted lines. We wanted to see the fitted line, but if we want to do a residual plot, we click the residual versus the X values. So we don't typically look at the Y value residual, do residuals versus X values. And there is the residual plot, plain and dull. This is what we wanted. This is what we, we kind of hoped for in this case, right? We wanted our model to be as, as good as we can. Plotting the residuals kind of gives us a little more confidence. If we started seeing patterns that looked like this, we go, uh-oh, that's a pattern. I can kind of tell what's going on. I'm going up, then going back down. This right here, the points are all over the place, which is good news for us. And again, um, no detectable pattern. Here it is on the um, on the TI. So let me go back to the TI. Let's go back to this screen here, and let's do a residual plot on the TI um, with the um, the um, income uh, problem here. Income versus the amount the amount spent on recreation versus income. I already have this data in here, so I'm going to turn it on and. I already have my data in L1 and L2 like I did before. I already ran the regression, so you have to run the regression. Once you run that regression, the calculator actually stores those residuals automatically. The problem is, is remember how to get there. I actually had to look it up. Because um, I usually use a, a software package if I'm actually going to plot residuals, because I'm going to print that out. Um, the TI will do that. Good. Um, second, Y equals. And we want to turn on our stat plot, so make sure it's on. And our X list, again, we're, we're plotting the residuals versus the X list, the, the X variable. So the X variable is L1. And Y list, how do we get to that residual? We go to second stat, and it's number seven there. It's that last list. I think you actually type R-E-S-I-D and it still work. Um, but why type it when it's right there? Okay, and now press zoom nine. And this plot looks exactly the same as the one here. All right? There's our zero. There's this point. We can trace that. So if I trace this point, so there's the 800 and there was the residual when I subtracted it from the predicted value. Okay? So I can trace these points here. Okay? And exactly the same as they are here. 
kind of like having that zero line through there. Nice visual. Got some above, some below, which is good. Okay, again, here is another residual plot. I leave it to you to go ahead and, and find that. This was the residual of the club head speed um, on the TI. So go ahead and uh, pause your pause the video here and see if you can do that. You want you to do one or two of these, or pretty much all in the same way. Uh, make sure you can go through the steps to do that. Again, put the data in for the club head speed, and do what we just did on the TI. Regression table. So you notice when I did that, when I ran the software in many TAM and stack crunch, a lot of stuff got spit out at us, right? Um, here was the mini tab output. Okay, and I may have been premature in trying to get us to interpret all that. There's probably a lot of stuff thrown at you at once, and I apologize, but here is the equation, and I think I actually have all these labeled. So there's the equation, the amount, and so again, maybe in the, where did I get this word amount? I got it from the, the, the heading that I had in there. So the amount is negative 222 plus 0.355 times the income. And you can be as descriptive as you want in this. They pulled these from the, the labels. Okay, there's our y-intercept, negative 222.49. And so that's what they got that. They just rounded it down. Here is the x, 0.355 is x, right? And so there's our slope of 0.355. And finally, here is r squared, r dash squared. Um, we really won't be looking at r squared adjusted right now. There's our r squared. And if you need to find r, sometimes they don't give you r. Um, this is r squared, so just take the square root of that, of 0 0.803, and that would give you r. Stat crunch for me, is a little easier to make out as they kind of give everything to us here. Um, Here's the equation, right? They give us r, which is nice. They give us r squared. And then they give us the slope. Here's our slope, and then there's our y-intercept. Everything we know, and we will not be looking at this stuff right here. And in fact, I don't think we're even gonna be looking at these other pieces here. So you just kind of have to put blinders on to some of these um, outputs. Get another example. Um, is nicotine content of a cigarette related to the TARS? Um, a collection of data in milligrams on 29 cigarettes produced a scatter plot, residual plot, and partial regression analysis, which is on the next slide. Um, part A, do you think linear model is appropriate here? Explain, and part B, explain the mean of R squared in this context. So rather than have you, like on a test or something, have to crunch out all of this, I mean several data sets, I may give you, I'll give you at least one where you'd have to crunch it out, right? Um, or a, there may be a part of a part of the test, maybe take home, and I get you to crunch that out. But an in-class test, this would be a great problem, right? So put a big star by that one. Um, something of this nature where I go ahead and give it to you, and you need to be able to interpret this. Um, so pause the video here and think about it. It is so important. I can't stress it enough. I know you're, you have other things going on, but pause it here just for maybe one minute and think about this. Is a linear model appropriate? Explain and then explain the meaning of R squared in the context. Welcome back. I know you did that. Um, so part A, do you think a linear model is appropriate here? Yeah. Um, the the data here is the actual data right here looks like it kind of flows in a linear linear fashion right our line kind of goes through most of the points actually and are pretty close to the other ones we don't have any curvature in these um, a little strange thing goes on here but that's expected with data I mean you're gonna have little pa um, little bloops and stuff like that and look at the residual plot really no pattern here um, the initial low points, but really not a clear curvature. I mean, it kind of comes back down. So seeing these low here and these low here kind of make me wonder, but really, really no pattern. It kind of it goes up and down everywhere in between. And part B, huh? oh, next, next slide. So I had to give you that slide there. 
So to answer part B, go ahead and pause the video here and see if you can explain. This is a big test. We've had two of these already. We're going to explain what does this r squared mean in context of this problem. Okay, welcome back. So what does r squared mean here? It means that 92.4% of the variability in the nicotine, in the Y. So 92.4% a variability in the nicotine, I'm abbreviating here, nicotine level actually, is explained by variability in cartan, tar, car, mm, tar content. It's explained by whoop, variability in tar content. So in other words, 92.4% of variability in nicotine level is explained by the linear model. Another way to, to think about that. But I like the uh, this way better. Okay, so I actually went through and relabeled these A, B, C, and D because I didn't know what the parts A and B were, but we just did parts A and B. So this actually is part C, D, E, and so this is really a good problem. We have lots of lots of questions here, and it doesn't take a lot of time to crunch to put data in and crunch it out. I've done that for you. We're just interpreting here. Um, so what is the correlation coefficient between tar and nicotine? Now remember what correlation coefficient is. I'm not going to always tell you find the correlation coefficient comma r, but that's what the correlation coefficient is. It's r, um, and again r is equal to the square root of r squared, right? So We've got r squared is 0.924, so we're going to do r is the square root of 0.924. And we get about, put a little wavy lines there for approximately about 0.961. So a very, um, very strong positive correlation association between tar and nicotine. So write the equation of the um, of the line. Before I do that, I need to comment. When we, whenever we take the square root of both sides, um, I need to take into account plus or minus. This could have been negative, but if you looked at the equation and looked at the plot, it was obviously going in the positive direction. So I, I probably should have said that. Okay, part D, write the equation of the regression line. And if we go over here, here's the equation right here. So you're just going to rewrite that right there. So I'll abbreviate this, nicotine equals um, 0 0.15403. plus 0 0.065052 times the tar. You could have certainly reversed these around. You could put that over there if you wanted to. Part E, estimate the nicotine content of cigarettes with 4 milligrams of tar. Do you see how easy it is now to, to figure that out since we've used our variables? I know I told you I wouldn't say that again, but I thought it necessary. So 4 milligrams of tar, I'm going to take that 4 and plop it in for the tar. I no longer have to make that translation that um, x was tar and then plug 4 in for x. It's already there for me. So when I plug that in, I get about 0.414 of nicotine. My pen's kind of pooping out on me. And that is milligrams. So the predictive value for nicotine is about 0.414 milligrams. Okay, part F, for each additional, uh, interpret the meaning of the slope of the regression line in this context. So here is the slope, right here. So that, little, that number there is a slope, so what does that number mean? So for each additional milligram of tar, 
the model predicts an increase of about 0 0.065 milligrams of nicotine. I won't write that down, I'm running out of room. I'll repeat it though. For each additional milligram of tar, the model predicts an increase of 0 0.065 milligrams of nicotine. Hopefully that makes sense. We've done that in earlier lessons. Uh, part E, what does the y-intercept mean? So the y-intercept is that, that value right here. Here's our value. So the y-intercept occurs when there's zero tar. So the y-intercept would just mean that the, uh, the model predicts that a cigarette with zero tar or no tar would have 0.154 milligrams of nicotine. I won't write that down. You can, you can get that, I think. Um, part F, if a new brand of cigarette contains 7 milligrams of tar, and a nicotine level whose residual is negative 0.5, what is the nicotine level? Okay, this one's a little bit tougher, right? We're going to have to to really figure out what it's saying. Now, some of you will be able to look at it and instantly tell um, what to do, but I'm going to go ahead and say, okay, I just plop this one little guy out. So if that's my tar, and there's my nicotine, and the model's doing something like this, so, um, at 7, what would the model predict it to be? And my residual is negative 0.5, so that means my, my actual value is somewhere down here, right? Because the residual is negative, so it's below it. And so I need to find this value and then just subtract it from 0.5. So what is that value? I'm going to use my equation and plug it in. So again, the nicotine is about 0 0.1540 plus 0 0.06505 times the tar, which I'm going to go ahead and plug in. And so the predicted value is 0 0.6094. So that's my predicted value. You see the, the niceness of the p hat, the hat. Not the P hat, but the um, the hat over these. It reminds me. This is a predicted value. The predicted value is 0 0.6094. My residual was negative 0.5, so that means my actual data point is 0.5 minus that, which would be what 0 0.1094. So 0 0.1094 is the answer. A little tricky. Um, you, graphing it out definitely helps you to see that, I think. Okay, a couple of misinterpretations we need to talk about. Um, and I'll illustrate this with a couple of examples. A uh, biology student who created a regression model to use a bird's height when perched for uh, predicting its wingspan made these two statements. Assuming the calculations were done correctly, explain what is wrong with each interpretation. So here's the first one. Uh, my R squared of 93% shows that this linear model is appropriate. So pause for a moment and tell me what is wrong with that statement. Okay, so R squared is indication of strength. It really has nothing to do with the appropriateness of the model. Um, we've already shown just recently in the last couple examples that we use the residual plot um, to indicate the appropriateness of the model. Okay, bar B. Um, another misconception here. A bird 10 inches tall will have a wingspan of 17 inches. So what is wrong with this statement? Pause the video and again try to think about it. If you don't write anything down, at least think about um, what you would say here. How would you correct this statement? Okay, welcome back. Um, it's just a little strong, right? Um, the will have. He really should have said um, uh, the model predicts that a bird 10 inches tall is expected to have a wingspan of 17 inches, or is predicted to have, because um, regression models give predictions. They don't give actual values. Okay, misinterpretations two. I think this is the last slide. A sociology student investigated the association between a country's literacy rate and life expectancy, and then drew the conclusions listed below. Explain why each statement is incorrect, and assume the calculations were done properly. Okay, part A. 
Uh, the literacy rate determines 64% of the life expectancy for a country. And this one's a little tougher um, to see what's wrong here. Um, it, it's really just a nuance in the variability. R squared measures the, measures the variability or the variation explained by the model. So it should have read literacy rates determine 64% of the variability in life expectancy. So that, that's a key phrase there. And then part B. Uh, the slope of the line shows that an increase of 5% in literacy rate will produce a two-year improvement in life, in life expectancy. So again, very similar to what happened in the last problem, right? They're just a little too um, prescriptive on what's going to happen. Uh, they give predictions, not actual values. We should have said the slope of the line shows an increase of 5% in literacy rate is associated with an expected two-year improvement in life expectancy. So expected, predicted, language like that. We need to soften it a little bit.